My name is Ankur Patel. I'm the Director of Advancement for Hindu University of America. Thank you for joining us for this Saturday webinar, wherever you may be. I'm in Los Angeles. It is the morning over here. If you want to, please put it in the chat where you are joining us from. It's always nice to see the diversity of folks that join us on these webinars. Today's uh, webinar is about reconstructing Hindu history. Uh, we're going to go into the state of the AIT, the Aryan invasion theory, the Aryan immigration theory, and the out of India theory debate and where we're at in that. And our special guest in conversation with president of HUA Sri Kalyan Vishwanathan is none other than Dr. Conrad Elst, who obtained his doctorate in Oriental philology and history from the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium back in 1998. Dr. Elst is affiliated with the Sunshi University of Buddhist and Indic Studies. Occasionally, he teaches at the Indus University in Ahmedabad and the Private Indology Academy in Houston. He has authored a dozen peer-reviewed papers, co-authored several books, contributed to a dozen more, and authored 18 English and eight Dutch books of his own. His publications mainly concern divergent aspects of the subcontinent's interreligious situation, Indo-European studies, the fundamental questions of religious thought, democracy, and language policy in both the European Union and in India. Thank you, Dr. Els, for joining us. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us for this special webinar. Uh, Koyanji, maybe I can hand it off to you for some framing of this important topic, and uh, we'll get started. Wonderful. <clears throat> Great. So, Ankur, thank you. And Dr. Conrad Els, thank you for joining us from uh, Belgium. Uh, we are very grateful for your uh, presence here today. And uh, hopefully this will be an engaging conversation. And I'd like to frame it in the following way. <clears throat> now, um, it's important that we recognize the, the distinction between and the relationship between facts and theories. Facts and theories. Sometimes the absence of distinction between facts and theories creates a misconception, a misunderstanding where we construe a theory to be a fact, right? So let me start just with a question, you know, is whatever I'm, I am saying right now, is that intelligible? Is that clear or no? You can say no, please. Is it clear or is it, is it not clear? Just type in your answer, yes or no, type in your answer. Clear, yes, okay, okay. Is there anybody for whom this is not clear? Not very sure, yeah, good, good, I like that, okay. Not very sure means you're telling the truth, okay. <laughs> because the world we live in today is a place where this these two things are frequently confused, frequently collapsed. So in other words, you know, somebody presents you a theory with a lot of authority and marshals their own scholarly authority in the defense of that theory, then we submit to that theory and start believing it to be a fact, the truth, because they are an expert in that field. You know, and it takes many, many long years to, to unravel, to figure out that it was just a theory not a fact at all, just a hypothesis. And, uh, you know, and a new hypothesis comes along, which uh, displaces the old hypothesis. And this is the way of human pursuit of knowledge, whether in the sciences or in the humanities, so-called social sciences, the liberal arts and so on. Yeah. Yeah, Ranjit Balal is saying theory is not a fact. Yeah. <clears throat> verification with evidence. Yeah. Well, what does verification really show you? It, it tells you that the particular evidence that you examined correlates rather well with the theory that 
someone proposed or not. It doesn't prove definitely that the theory is true. What it does is it says, as far as this evidence is concerned, it seems to correlate with the theory. Now, tomorrow you may uncover a different piece of evidence that completely falsifies the theory. So, in fact, it's very hard to prove any theory to be totally true. It's very hard because, you know, no amount of evidence will conclusively establish a theory to be true. In fact, even one observation, one contrary observation that challenges the theory will break it down, will, will collapse the theory. And if, if, a, if a scholar is honest, they will spend their efforts not trying to prove their theories, but rather to disprove them. Because when you try to disprove your theory and you find evidence and you keep trying to disprove it and you keep trying to disprove it and you can't find any evidence after a lot of search that disproves a certain theory, then perhaps one can say the theory has withstood the test of falsification or it has withstood the challenges of evidence. Okay, so I mean, I know that that's a lot in there in what I just said uh, in terms of theories and facts. Now, when it comes to the question of uh, the 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 population of India, you know, who are the Indians, the Hindus, the Vedic people? Were they Aryans? Were they Dravidians? Who are they? What happened? You know. There is a lot of argumentation, a lot of theories, and there's evidence marshaled to support this theory, evidence ignored, evidence uh, selectively not taken into consideration. Yeah, Ramesh is saying theory is provable, You're completely wrong. No theory can be totally proved. Okay, so these are all the confusions we have in our minds. You know, what you can marshal is only a preponderance of preponderance of evidence that has failed to disprove a theory. That's all you can do. You can't really prove it because a single observation that contests the theory, that falsifies the theory, would break the theory down. So, th I mean, this kind of argumentation is appropriate for people really engaged in the conversation about what are theories, what are provable theories, disprovable theories, and so on and so forth. But anyway, with that little preamble, when it comes to the facts on the ground, there were, you know, the, the critical fact that was observed in uh, 18th century, 19th century, uh, in the interaction between Europe and India, uh, especially in, uh, in India, in Germany, in England, in France, and, you know, many other universities, was that there were certain observable similarities between Sanskrit as a language and many, many European languages, Greek, Latin, German, English, French, Iranian, and so on and so forth. And that fact had to be explained. In, in other words, you know, it, it, it demanded that we should come up with some explanatory uh, story that would uh, kind of explain how this happened, you know, how can there be a similarity between Sanskrit, which was deeply embedded in India, not really found anywhere else, and then Greek, Latin, and other languages of Europe, how could they exhibit a similarity? So right as people started investigating this question, the first thing that came about was the idea of an Indo-European family of languages, okay? And of course, uh, that begged the question, you know, how did this, where did this family of languages originate? Did they come from India? Did they come from Europe? Did they come from Asia somewhere else? Did they come from Iran? Did they come from the Steppes? Did they come from the Casp the, uh, did somewhere near the Caspian Sea, the Caucasian Mountains, near Gobleki, Tepe, on and on. So a lot of speculation around this particular question. Now, uh, Dr. Conrad Elst has been uh, examining this question 
rather deeply, examining the debates on both sides, the so-called Aryan invasion theory, as well as the out of India theory. And today he's gonna to take us through some slides in which he's gonna summarize the state of the debate. And as he moves through his slides, uh, I, I may interrupt him from time to time to ask a question, mm -hmm. uh, to largely by way of clarification and maybe occasionally to challenge this certain position he's taking, but hopefully it'll be clarifying for everybody and we can get a sense of the state of the debate. And then towards the end, we'll go, we'll, we'll look at where do we go from here? What is the future of this conversation you know, as we look ahead in the next decades, maybe even the next century and so on. So with that preamble, uh, over to you, Dr. Konrad Elst. Yes. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Here we are. Yes. Mm -hmm. Slow computer, but it's there. I guess you can already see the title page. <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to talk about the Aryan debate. This uh, is about the Indo-European language family, which unites most European and North Indian languages. Some of them are extinct, like Anatolian or in India, Proto Bangani, spoken in Uttarakhand. Um, but for the rest, most of the languages concerned are in there. <clears throat> it is uh, questioned in India whether this is really a language family. So linguists have reconstructed an ancestral common language, namely Proto-Indo-European, spoken nearly 6,000 years ago. And what people in India often don't like about it is that it cuts through borders. That is to say, it unites North Indians with Europeans and does not unite them, rather excludes the Dravidian and Munda speaking Indians. So, um, well, you may see some, some evil conspiracy behind this, but in fact, you see, linguistics has its own way of uh, arriving at facts, and these are not always respectful of political agendas, not even so, very benign ones like Indian unity. So, uh, Conrad, let me ask a question, okay? Yeah. See, the, w w can we agree that the Proto-Indo-European language is just a hypothesis? Yeah, I mean, of course, I wasn't there, I, except in reincarnation perspective, but no, I wasn't there. So strictly speaking, anything is possible, Yeah. but it is extremely unlikely. Mm -hmm. And you see, of all these people who doubt this hypothesis, I've never seen anyone bring up a more likely hypothesis. So I think it's pretty well established. And so I want to emphasize that the same exercise has been done with other language families where there was no colonial angle, no racial angle. Even before Indo-European, the Uralic language family was you know, all whites, the researchers were all white, no racial angle, no colonial angle. That was established already 50 years before Indo-European. And so when, when anyway, you, when, you may not say, believe me, but you see, I really want to refer to Sri Kantalageri, mm -hmm. who is a Hindu like most of you, and who puts it all in a language that Hindus can perfectly understand. He explains why this language family should not be doubted. In his opinion, it's a complete waste of time to doubt this. Uh, so those are the, the, the papers on his blog spot. 
Um, so I, I advise everyone to read those. So, yes. so Conrad, just one more question on that, right? Mm -hmm. See, we is it possible to accept the idea of the Indo-European language family as a likely, as a more, as a likely phenomenon? You know, and there is a lot of evidence to show for that. Yeah. But still, question the idea of a specific Proto-Indo-European language that existed at some historical time. Is that possible? Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> of course that's possible. That's possible. But I don't think you're going to go very far with it. Mm. You're certainly excluding yourself from the ongoing conversation. And so I, I don't see it go anywhere. I mean, mm. people are free to try and, and they actually do. But you see, this is a battle we can win. Whereas with that battle, I, I don't see against whom it is, and I certainly don't see how to win it. But again, you see, that's me. You know, people who want to try it are free to do so. Right. Now, the, um, the distrust of Proto-Indo-European often extends into a distrust of linguistics as a science itself which is very bizarre because linguistics is really something that India ought to be proud of. You see, linguistics came about in Europe when Sanskrit was discovered and when the Sanskrit grammarians were discovered. And so the whole science of, of, of modern linguistics is a child of Sanskrit linguistics. The very first Sanskrit word I ever learned was the word Sandhi. Sandhi means a euphonic combination of an earlier word and a later word. And so I learned this in the, the course in school of my mother tongue, where the difference was explained between standard Dutch as spoken in Amsterdam and so on, um, where two words, dot ding, which means that thing, are combined with a four word sandhi, that is to say, the earlier word adapts to the later word, dubbing. Whereas in the Flemish dialects, the reverse happens. You have a reverse sandhi or a backward sandhi. The voiceless sound of the first word imposes itself on the originally voiced sound of the second word. So you say dot ting instead of dot ding, right? Now the teacher explained this using the Sanskrit word sandhi because that's what linguists do. So, <laughs> you know, Indians ought to be proud of this whole construct of uh, linguistics. And a little, a little thing to know, a little tidbit for that matter is that even in another field, in chemistry, the periodic table of elements was inspired by the Sanskrit alphabet. The same orderliness of the Sanskrit alphabet is found back in this periodic table of elements. So <laughs> linguistics is not a racist pseudoscience, as I've often heard. It is something that India ought to be proud of. <clears throat> anyway, so India has a certain linguistic unity. Um, I don't know any Dravidian or Munda language, I have to confess. But Indians tell me that it is fairly easy to translate a text from, let's say, Canada into Marathi, uh, because the sentence patterns are the same. You know, it's far more difficult to translate Hindi into Chinese or even into English. You see, because all the Indian languages, no matter where they come from, no matter what family they belong to, have been together for so long that they've started to resemble each other. And so like Tamil, for example, there is a certain Tamil separatism. Well, in fact, even the oldest written Tamil that we know is already strongly influenced by Sanskrit, both linguistically and also philosophically like the ideas expressed in the Tirukural, 
are very similar to what you find in Dharma Shastras. You know, so there was a Hindu unity as well as a, a linguistic sort of unity, it's what linguists call a Sprachbund or linguistic area. That very much is there in India. But so that's different from the concept of language family. Anyway. Uh, yeah, they also call it a ghost language and so on. Forget about that. Then um, Indo-European was discovered. It was first mapped out in 1767 by a French Jesuit living in South India, Gaston Laurent Coeur d'Eau. And so he sent it to the Paris uh, Academy where one of the scholars who heard of it was uh, Voltaire. We'll meet him in a moment. Uh, it was officially made known to the world public in Bengal, 1786, by uh, William Jones. Uh, it was not immediately given a name. The name Indo-European is from the early 19th century. The word Aryan also soon appeared in 1808. Earlier, the word Aryan, Aryan had already been used in French, but only for the Indo-Iranian languages, not for Latin, Greek, Germanic, and so on. Whereas Friedrich Schlegel used it for the whole Indo-European family. And so that usage has remained with us at least till 1945 and in India, in fact, till today. So that was the out of India theory. At that time, nobody called it the out of India theory. That name was only coined uh, when it was revived in the late 20th century by Edwin Bryant uh, from America. Um, but so the idea that India was the homeland and that immigrations came from there, that was universal. You see, that was automatically assumed. Nobody doubted that. And so it went together with a certain Indomania in Europe. And so a number of scholars were enthusiastic at the idea that European culture ultimately came from India. Also in William Jones's speech, and William Jones was of course an absolute colonialist. He was part of the East India Company. Nevertheless, he speaks very high of Sanskrit. Um, right, so that theory dis disappeared around 1840. But so the first 60 years that the Indo-European family was known, India was automatically and universally taken to be the homeland. 1982, it came back with the book by K.D. Setana Karpasa about the phenomenon of cotton in India, which was very much there in the archaeological um, excavations of Harappan cities, but was not yet there in the Rig Veda. So he concludes that the Rig Veda is older than the Harappan city. Okay. Mm. So then um, in the European scholarship starts with a grammar of Sanskrit by Franz Bopp. Um, so that starts the reconstruction with great difficulty of what this mother tongue should have been. <laughs> Interesting about Franz Bob is that he already saw links between Indo-European and Austronesian or Malayo-Polynesian. That's interesting because when Sri Kantalagiri came up with that in 1993, immediately he was dismissed. Oh, this is Hindu fanaticism, blah, 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 blah. Not at all. You see, this is from Franz Bob as orthodox as you can get, repeated again by an established scholar, Isidore Dian, uh, in the 60s, and so on. This is a very familiar pattern. You see, whenever anything is said in favor of the out of India theory, it is immediately dismissed as Hindu fanaticism and far fetched and superstitious, and so on. Another example from a different field, the Saraswati River. 
you see people like Steve Farmer in America, for instance, dismiss all talk of Saraswati. Oh, this is Hindu Dwala. In fact, that the Saraswati River, first of all, existed and that it is equal to, but bigger than, the Gagar River in Haryana. That has already been said by a French archaeologist in the 1850s and by many Western archaeologists ever since. There is nothing Hindu to a concoction about this. Okay. Then the brother of Friedrich Schlegel, namely August Schlegel, in 1834, for the first time posited a homeland outside India, namely near the Caucasus Mountains. Initially, this is controversial. This is just one hypothesis. And so just like now people don't want to abandon the Aryan invasion <laughs> hypothesis, back then people didn't want to abandon the out of India hypothesis. And we do not have just some dusty library scholars. Um, we even have someone of a tribe that, you know, modern Hindus love to, to, to shoot at namely the colonialists. Mount Stuart Elphinstone had been the governor of Mumbai presidency for the uh, out, um, uh, East India Company. It was as colonialist as you can get. And yet um, he noticed that of all the Indian literature and so on, there is no indication whatsoever of a foreign homeland. So he argues himself that this is opposed by the Manu Smriti, this is opposed by the Vedas and so on. They don't contain any indication of this. Now you could say, okay, but Greek mythology also doesn't give an indication of where the Greeks came from. All right, but there is 2000 years between the arrival of the Greeks in Greece and the appearance of Greek literature. By contrast, the theory says that the Aryans immigrated in India in about 1500 BC and the Vedas start at about 1500 BC and indeed some parts of the Rig Veda are deemed to describe the conquest of India by the Aryan invaders against the dark aboriginals. <clears throat> So that's not the same story. Here there's no room for forgetfulness. If there was an Aryan invasion, it should be described. And yet, according to Elphinstone, the common origin of the Sanskrit language with those of the West leaves no doubt that there was once a connection between the nations by whom they are used, but it proves nothing regarding the place where such a connection subsisted, nor about the time. This incidentally is again very interesting for Hindus who think that accepting the linguistic evidence of an uh, Indo-European family necessitates and implies the, um, the non-Indian homeland and the Aryan invasion. That's not the case at all. Linguistic evidence is rather vague. It's a weak kind of evidence. It can give some indications doesn't give proof. And so there is no linguistic proof. Don't let them tell you otherwise. There is no linguistic proof for the Aryan invasion theory, which is admitted by many leading linguists themselves. Okay, so <clears throat> to say that it spread from a central point is a gratuitous assumption. You see, if you say it came from the Caucasus from somewhere there in Russia, it has the advantage of lying nicely in the middle between the Atlantic coast and the Bay of Bengal. Well, you see, <laughs> the spread does not necessarily start in the middle. In fact, we'll see some counter examples. Um, and anyway, you see, if they could go as far as the Bay of Bengal and as far as Ireland and Iceland and Portugal, then they could easily from the Caucasus have gone to Arabia, have gone to Palestine, to Egypt and so on. Why haven't they gone there? You know, so to find some logic in the way that they spread from a middle point in Russia, that, that is neither here nor there. 
The question, according to him, therefore is still open. There is no reason whatever for thinking that the Hindus ever inhabited any country but their present one. All right. Nevertheless, you see that was a rear guard action. Um, from about 1840, the Aryan invasion theory uh, wins the day. There are different opinions about where the homeland was. It could also be in Germany, in the Balkans, in Anatolia, and so on. Since 1926, there is a growing consensus for Southwest Russia. In the 1950s, Maria Gimbutas confirmed this by talking of the Kurgan culture marked by grave hills. That means Kurgan. And they overpowered old Europe. Of course, many people have remarked back then already that this was a bit ideologically colored. You see, Maria Gimbutas was a Lithuanian refugee in the United States. And so she depicts the Aryan attack on Europe somewhat like the Russian, the, the Soviet aggression against the Baltic states. That's a remark that was made all the time at that time. Um, anyway, so she gives a scenario that is still widely believed. You had an old European culture, which was agricultural, stable, peaceful, somewhat matriarchal, and that was overpowered by the Aryans coming from Russia. Well, so far, so good. You know, for Europe, that may be the true story. The question is only, where did those people in Russia come from? See, you see, this is the common scenario these days. They start somewhere there, uh, north of the Caspian Sea. Um, so people assume this is right because it seems logical. It's very symmetrical. It starts in the middle. Now, in fact, what happens is it's a projection of what happened to Europe, which was invaded from this area, onto India, which is also projected to be invaded from that area. But in fact, there's no ground for saying so. In the case of Europe, there is plenty of uh, archaeological and also genetic evidence for a great disruption. You see a great change uh, as a result of an invasion from the East. In India, all such uh, evidence has been completely absent. So in Europe, you can see what an Aryan invasion looks like. And in India, you can't find trace of it. Moreover, more and more scholars are now saying that that so-called homeland in Southwest Russia is only a secondary homeland. That those people already, let's say, colonized this area coming from somewhere else. Then there is a question, you see, I, I, I easily call it Aryan invasion theory. Most people in India do. <laughs> but you see, some Western scholars have taken me to task for using this term invasion. They say, oh, but we, we don't swear by an invasion anymore. You see, in the 19th century, everybody automatically thought that this was a military style invasion because they all knew, for instance, the Romans conquered the world with military conquest. The colonizers conquered America and India and so on with military conquest. So that was just not questioned. That was the way things happened. And um, so some scholars in the modern age, even like who, who lived through, for example, the resistance in the Second World War. Oh, what happened? Don't know if you can hear me, but. Uh, we can hear you. We can hear you. Ah, OK. We can okay. see the screen, though. Right, right, right. Anyway, I hope it comes back. But meanwhile, I'll, I'll tell my story. So. Uh, oh, now we can hear you. Conrad, we can't hear you anymore.
Can you hear me? Raise your finger if you can hear me. Ankur can hear me. Yeah, it looks like uh, Dr. Else is frozen. Um... Okay, let me just give him a few seconds here, okay, to regroup. In the meantime, let's take a couple of questions, okay? Yeah. I'm opening the question uh, box. Can Sanskrit itself, can it be the mother of all Indo-European languages? The chase of some forgotten proto-mother does not seem to yield fruit. Yeah, it's definitely possible. And in fact, uh, we're going to post a question to Dr. Conrad Elst as we move forward. Okay, how do you relate the periodic table to the Sanskrit alphabet? Okay, we'll ask the question to Conrad. When actually this language Sanskrit discovered? <laughs> Who started? Yeah, well, Sanskrit, we can, we can tell you more clearly when, it, when and how it disappeared. It disappeared from broad usage because the support for the language was withdrawn in the traditional educational environments, the, the Gurukulas, Vedic Patshalas, etc., was completely removed. And instead, the money extracted from colonial revenues was redirect, redirected towards Christian missionary schools. And English education began to be favored and Sanskrit education began to be undermined and that happened in the 1830s onwards, 1830, 1840. And by the time you come to 1870, 1880, 1900, the, the widespread presence of Sanskrit that existed previously uh, completely collapses. Okay. But as to when it was discovered or when it was created, you got to go back thousands of years. And it's a very intriguing question, uh, you know, uh, requiring a lot of research and exploration. Vikas Mithal. Yeah, this not so division is a very favorite European theory because uh, they keep saying it again and again as though it's a fact. And, uh, uh, you know, it's very really interesting how certain uh, uh, areas of consensus are developed amongst scholars. Once they agree with each other, there is sufficient agreement about a certain hypothesis. They begin to relate to it like that's now established. It's no longer contestable. Uh, so in order to contest it, then what you have to do is we'll have to deal with what brought about that consensus to begin with. And is there a different... Uh, theory, different hypothesis that can explain the evidence that supported the original consensus. Okay, so it becomes a, a, a much more complicated process to dislodge a consensus once a bunch of scholars have arrived at it, especially when most of them are European. Okay, and one of the difficulties Hindus face in dislodging that consensus is that uh, we do not have adequate expertise in the European languages. Okay, I think Dr. Conrad is coming back. Can you uh, hear me? Yes. yes, yes. Okay. Well, uh, this is on my smartphone here. I don't have PowerPoint, oh. but it's, I know my story. Let me see if I have your PowerPoint. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you have it. That's right. So I, I can pull it up. One second. Let me share my screen. Okay. Okay, and uh, we'll move to the right slide and then you can pick up the conversation. Yes, okay, excellent. Okay. 
Right. Okay, next. This yes, so the question is whether it was an invasion. So D point, the basic point is an invasion, the term invasion does not pertain to the means which are used, namely military or other, but to the end achieved, namely reversal of the power equation. Those who were first outside are not only in, as in an immigration, but they are also in power. And so that's definitely what the Aryans in the Aryan invasion scenario were. You see, they came to power in India. They imposed their language and their religion. So they, they came to power. Anyway, next. Um, right. Now with his choice of the Caucasus, maybe free, um, August Schlegel hadn't bargained for this but it actually played a great role in the racialization of the notion Aryan. Because the Caucasus had already been taken as a homeland, namely the scholar Johann Blumenbach around 1800 had decided that that area was the homeland of the white race. That's why in America, they still use the term Caucasian for white. So until then, the term Aryan had not been particularly racially charged. Like Friedrich Schlegel, um, he was the son-in-law of the Jewish writer Moses Mendelssohn. So at that time, racism inside Europe mostly meant anti-Semitism. So I was not there at all. Um, anyway, so racism came came into vogue around 1860, first with the French writer Arthur de Gobineau, and then in 1859, Darwin published his uh, The Origin of Species. And from then on, race became the all-purpose uh, explanation for everything, like the British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli and here again, we talk of like the summit of colonialism. He called race the key to all of history. And so from then you get people like Theodor Pöschke, who calls the Aryans blonde and blue eyed. And Karl Penka, who situates the homeland in Scandinavia, where most people are like white like that. Next. And so this gives rise to a lot of racialist misunderstandings and in particular mistranslations of Sanskrit texts. Like for instance, the, the Vedic word anas, which means an as without mouth is interpreted as a nas, that is to say without nose, snub nosed, flat nosed, like Africans. All the words for black are identified with natives. In fact, the word black is a very usual term to indicate the enemy. Like in the Second World War, uh, collaborators of the Axis powers uh, were called both in English and French, in Dutch and so on, were called blacks. Like in British army reports about Subhas Chandra Bose, he's consistently called a black. Um, the word varna, color, literally color or quality, uh, but which is used in India for uh, a division in society, which is often translated as caste, that was now interpreted as skin color, so that the castes were deemed to be a sort of racial apartheid system. Just like in South Africa, you had the whites, the coloreds, the Indians, and the blacks. So similarly, the Brahmins, Kshatriyas, and so on were deemed to be a matter of skin color. The most important element here is the Battle of the Ten Kings, a famous scene from the Rigveda, 
perhaps the most important historical event described therein. So that was interpreted as a battle of the white invaders against, and I quote, the Asikni Lisha. And this was clumsily translated as the Black Tribe. Now, in reality, Asikni here is the name of a river, which is literally the Black River, but is the name of the Chenab River in West Punjab. So what it describes is not the Black Tribe, but the tribe from the Asikni River, right? This is one of the most consequential uh, mistranslations in world history. Next. Yeah, next slide, please. I, I have more. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Against racialization. That's the difference. Okay. Well, <clears throat> first of all, in Hindu tradition, none of this racial business is present. Like, for instance, in the Manu Smriti, you find that because they didn't observe the Vedic mores, that therefore the Greeks and the Chinese are fallen Aryas. They used to practice Aryan, um, Aryan customs and they gave up. That's why they're fallen Aryans, but they used to be Aryans, whatever their race. Uh, also, some scholars of Indo-European opposed this racialization, like Max Müller. Um, emphasized that he himself had declared again and again, if I say Aryan, I mean neither blood nor bones, nor hair nor skull. I mean simply those who speak an Aryan language. And in fact, that wasn't very hard to find because once the um, Indo-European family was established, it was obvious that about half its population was white, about half its population was brown. So obviously here, the language had crossed a racial frontier, either in the one direction or in the other, but certainly language could not be identified with um, a physical type. After 1945, this became obvious. And so we in our courses of Indo-European linguistics have always learned this. You cannot identify this with a race or with any physical trait. However, it seems that these wise lessons were in vain because a few years ago, the Aryan invasion camp in India started um, you know, crowing about a research by David Reich from Harvard showing some kind of immigration in about 1500 BC. And so they started saying that the R1A gene is the Aryan gene. That you see, if you find that popping up in late Harappa, it means that the Aryans are invading, right? So that's, a, 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 you couldn't have believed it, but it's a fall back to this 19th century identification of language with physical traits. Next. Right, Friedrich uh, Max Müller, who called himself Moksha Mula. Uh, he tends to be identified in India with the Aryan invasion theory. In fact, it's older than, than his work, um, but he's important for his estimation of the chronology. You see, he thought that this happened in about 1500 BC. And it is to be noted that not just the ugly, vicious Hindu Twa people, but also perfectly respectable um, mainstream Indo-European scholars disagreed with this. They said, this is impossible. And so, because you have all this all this ideological evolution between the Rig Veda and the Buddha. And so to get at that, you need a longer period of time than hardly 1000 years. Another thing about uh, Max Müller is of course, he is representative of the very many Orientalists who supported the Christianization of India. 
Uh, sometimes he speaks very positively about the Vedas, sometimes not. Sometimes he says, well, it is, it is superstition, you know, we have to replace it with Christianity. So there were many more of those in India, especially the Dravidianist scholars like Caldwell and Pope. So, you know, with that, I can understand that Hindus have a certain grudge against Orientalism. Next. Yes, Hitler. You see, our enemies, they love to bring in Hitler. Like uh, Sheldon Pollock, for example, has said that Nazism is nothing but Hinduism, is nothing but Mimansa applied. You see, uh, Mimansa taken out of these dusty manuscripts and put into practice. That, according to him, uh, is ultimately Nazism, is the concentration camps, is the Holocaust. That's Mimansa in practice. <laughs> Now, this is totally nonsensical, but I'd like you to appreciate that this in modern Western culture is the absolutely most hateful thing you can say about anyone. It's to call him a Nazi, let alone the source of all Nazism. Right, so here in this debate also, some people like to bring in Hitler and they say, oh yeah, you know, these Hindus, you know, claiming the homeland for themselves, that, that's like Hitler. Well, not at all. And Hitler was, in this case, very explicit about where he stood. So first of all, all the Nazi school books taught, of course, the Aryan invasion theory. And they were not very fanatical about where precisely in Europe. It could be Germany, it could also be Russia, as it was thought most at the time but certainly not India, because that was deemed racially inferior. And so, for example, if there was a swastika in Nazi usage, it was not because it came from India. On the contrary, he thought that the Aryan invaders had taken the swastika from Europe to India. Now, he also um, pronounced himself quite explicitly we know that the Hindus in India are a people mixed from the lofty Aryan immigrants and the dark black Aboriginal population, and that this people is bearing the consequences today, for it is also a slave people of a race all that almost seems like a second Jewry. And in the mouth of Hitler, that was not meant as a compliment. Um, he, even, he even uses the term immigrant rather than invader, exactly like the fashion nowadays among the Aryan invasion crowd. You see, apart from this, uh, this fortuitous uh, quote, I'd like you to understand that at heart, the Aryan invasion theory really is the cornerstone of the Nazi worldview. Why? Well, it has all the elements. First, you have white Europeans who are, of course, dynamic and adventurous, penetrating the country of these indolent, dark natives and conquering it, of course. And so then secondly, they are very race conscious. That's what the Nazis wanted their people to be. So they impose the caste system as a racial apartheid system. Unfortunately, thirdly, they didn't entirely succeed. They mixed somewhat. I mean, the high castes are still more Aryan than the low caste, but nevertheless, they got mixed. And so it is good for them to be, and as the fourth point, to be colonized by pure white. And so he had nothing against the British. The British actually came from Germany and they were racially as good as the Germans. So it was very good that they ruled India. And it was good for the Indians also, you know, because they themselves can't rule themselves because they are racially compromised. And so they need a good race to rule over them. That's, you know, in short, Hitler's view of, of the Hindus. Next. 
Now in India, meanwhile, and this is something that Westerners don't know anything about, the Aryan race theory has continued full steam. And so about 1870, it started with Jyoti Rao Pule, who was a, an alumnus of a Christian uh, college. And he identified the upper castes as Aryan invaders. This is still alive in 2015. Congress leader Malikarjuna Kharge famously shouted in parliament, you Aryans are from outside India. And in a press comment on this scene, um, someone said that the only indigenous people in India are the Adivasis. So this strongly pits the non-Indo-Aryan speakers against the Indo-Aryans. And most of all the tribals or so-called Adivasis against the rest. The word Adivasi is naively taken by many outsiders as a native word testifying to the fact that the Indo-Aryans were always conscious of themselves being invaders and so labeling the tribals as aboriginals. But in fact, this is a coinage from the 1920s. It's not older than that, it's a missionary coinage. And it is, I would say, a really brilliant one word disinformation campaign. The uh, reservation system that was started by the British, but that is now all over the place in India, is also a relic of this uh, race theory. Next. Now, it must be said that many Hindus accepted the Aryan invasion theory simply out of respect for the prestige of European scholarship. They thought, you know, if the Europeans say it, it must be true. At that time, you know, they thought so. And some even enthusiastically embraced it because they could also make good use of it. Like they were not so inferior to the British, they were related to the British. In America, Indian immigrants even tried to use it in order to get themselves classified as white. Sometimes it succeeded in some courts, sometimes not. Uh, even nationalists accepted it, like Savarkar was not enthusiastic about it, but since you know he couldn't he couldn't thwart the um, European scholars, he accepted it. Bala Gangadhar Atilak went further and created his own version of the Aryan invasion theory with the homeland being in the Arctic. Now, you see, it's normal that many people accepted it simply because it's not so important. You see, it's about where people moved 4,000 years ago. Now, most countries in the world, the nation that lives there now wasn't there 4,000 years ago, or even 400 years ago. Mexico was not Spanish 3,000 years ago. It was not even Aztec 3,000 years ago. The Aztecs were also invaders coming from North America, from Utah, and so on. I mean, similar situations all over the world. You know, South Africa was not black. It was the country of the Bushmen and the Hottentots and the Bantus only came later down to South Africa. Um, and so on and so on. The Austronesian people who live in Madagascar, in New Zealand and so on. They conquered the whole place maybe 2000 years ago. And so on and so on. And so nobody's going to say, oh, the people in Madagascar shouldn't be there because they're invaders too. I mean, really, um, you know, this is so long ago. I, this is no point. So the Indians were just being very level-headed by not caring, caring too much about this, this origin question. However, it is the Aryan invasion believers in India. It is they who made this an issue. It is they who started saying, you are legitimate here because your ancestors 4,000 years ago invaded here. 
And so because of this, because of the constant use of the Aryan invasion theory in India for sowing hate, uh, Hindus have finally decided that it was wise to counter that. And so when the out of India theory was revived around 1990, then of course they, they stood behind it. That's normal. Next. Right. Um, so when when Hindu nationalists heard of the revival of the out of India theory, they were quite happy because finally that countered the enormous political use of the Aryan invasion theory. Now, strange thing is that many pro Aryan invasion theorists in India and especially abroad they don't want to soil their hands on the out of India theory because it is so political to them. It is so contaminated with Hindu nationalism. Now, first of all, it did not arise from Hindu nationalism. In fact, it, it revived the theory that was created by Europeans in the 18th century. But even then you see, the politicized out of India theory is absolutely nothing compared to the politicization of the Aryan invasion theory, which was, you know, associated with British colonialism, with Nazism, and then with a whole uh, array of political movements inside India, like Dravidian separatism, like Ambedkarism and like the Christian missions. Um, so if people don't want a theory because it's political, then they should absolutely shun the Aryan invasion theory. They should never touch it with a barge pole because it's the most political theory in world history. Anyway, nevertheless, it is not concocted. You know, it's not true that some colonialist at some point sat down in his veranda in Calcutta and thought, oh my God, how am I going to fool these Hindus? How am I going to oppress and exploit them? Ah, I have it. Let's invent the Aryan invasion theory. You see, <laughs> that's not how it works. You know, nothing of that sort has ever happened. It's uh, the other way around. Somebody thought of the Aryan invasion theory, some scholar. Uh, and then later, when the colonists heard of it, they saw that they could use it. And then that's what they did. Next. And we're almost there. Um, yes. Yes, we're going to finish with uh, a few examples of the pressure that exists against uttering any form of sympathy with the out of India theory. Around 2000, there was a bit of a friendly debate. This is uh, largely owing to Edwin Bryant, an American who is also a Hare Krishna. And so he wrote his PhD thesis precisely about this debate. And then he edited a volume together with, what's her name? Um, uh, a, a book bringing together uh, expressions of both positions. Like I've also contributed to it, Sri Kantalageri, of course. Uh, at that time, there was still Satya Swaru Mishra in Indian linguists and so on but also Michael Witzel and so on. But the sphere was rather friendly. This was a polite debate. And several other papers like by uh, Hans Heinrich Hock, one of the top Indo-Europeanists in the West. But you see that that didn't last long. And so, uh, scholars started feeling a pressure not to say anything that could play into the hand of the out of India theorists. For example, Joanna Nichols, 
she published a paper in 1997 showing that the pattern of loan words from Indo-European in all the Mesopotamian languages suggested that the origin of these Indo-European words lay in the East, Afghanistan and perhaps further. <clears throat> now this very much played into the hands of the out of India theory, like it is used by uh, Sri Kantalagiri to this effect. And so she was pressured, you know, oh my God, you shouldn't say this, but she said, well, you know, the facts are the facts. You know, I've, 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 you know, made a really nice discovery and, and that stands. But she agreed, you see, when, when she republished her paper on academia.edu, uh, she added a note saying, yeah, you know, I stand by this, this, this text, these findings, but it should not be taken to prove the out of India theory. So Sri Kantalagiri laughed at this, at this, you know, quasi uh, Stalinist damage control measure to, uh, to prevent the out of India theory. A similar thing was done by Klaus Peter Zoller, the discoverer of Proto-Bangani. Proto-Bangani is a very European looking language found inside India, in Uttarakhand. And so it indicates I won't say it proves because in linguistics, it's very soft evidence. It indicates, I don't say it proves, um, that in fact, the European languages come from India, not the other way around. And so again, you see, he says, yes, I stand by my discovery, great discovery, but maybe it can be explained in a different way than as a European language inside India. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, that's how it goes. And um, the reason for this is perhaps best explained in my last slide. Next. This is the issue of stonewalling. You see what we have the last, let's say 15 years is a complete standstill in the debate because the Aryan invasion camp just doesn't want to notice what we are doing. And so um, during the work uh, of, and the discussion about the work of Edwin Bryant, whom I mentioned, um, she, um, uh, so he edited this book, uh, bringing together the two theories. And so she, um, she was against that. She said, you know, what you do this way is that you give respectability to what is really uh, no more than the theory of intelligent design of creationism. You see, she likens the out of India theory to some superstition, uh, to some, you know, Christian fundamentalist anti-science conspiracy theory. And that therefore we should not only disagree with it, we should not even dignify it with any form of recognition at all, we should totally ignore it. And whether her hand reaches that far or, or for another reason, but at any rate, the result is that the last 15 years, there has indeed been no debate. So that's more or less the situation that you're facing at the moment. Right, any... Um, any comment at this point? Yeah, so let me let me ask you a couple of quick questions. Uh, but before I do that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Yes. Uh, so I want to, uh, for the benefit of the audience today, uh, I want to uh, inform everybody that uh, uh, Conrad, Dr. Conrad else will be teaching a course in the summer quarter. There's a lot of uh, noise here. Yeah. Conrad, can you go on mute for just a second? Unmute, yes. Can you go on mute? Can you mute yourself? Yeah. So uh, Dr. Conrad else will be teaching a course in the summer quarter called Distortions in uh, Indian Historiography. 
he's not going to deal with the Aryan invasion theory or the uh, out of India theory in that course. He's going to deal with something much more recent, which is, uh, you know, he's going to uh, explore the question of why contemporary historians in India, especially post-independent India, keep suppressing specific facts of evidence, uh, you know, and they, they deny that it ever existed, uh, they, and which he terms uh, a phenomenon which he terms negationism. And negationism is a, it's like a denial of a certain historical fact, which you cannot, you cannot possibly uh, ever deny, but still, it's a style of writing history in which you keep on negating, keep on denying certain facts of history. Like Holocaust deniers, in the case of negationism in India, it is the denial of uh, Islamic violence in India. And, you know, in favor of writing about some kind of syncretic uh, Hindu-Muslim culture in India, uh, that in the rhetoric is, the narrative is preferred and it requires that the violence that committed by Islam in India totally be suppressed. So this is the theme of the course, Distortions in Indian Historiography. Um, you know, the, the course is a two credit course. It's, a, um, you know, it's, a, it's based on his book. And of, of course, a lot more new material that he's gonna to bring to bear on this. Um, and, uh, you know, the course is priced at $400. We're gonna offer a discount for the next three days until Monday evening, you can purchase it for, for $300. And I want to encourage everybody to, uh, you know, who's interested to sign up and take that course. Okay. So with that brief uh, promotion for that course, uh, now Ankur is going to put up a survey, uh, you know, please fill out that survey. There are only three answers. You can do it in 30 seconds. Everybody just fill out that survey. Now, uh, Conrad, I want to ask you a question. To kind of move the conversation forward, which is, uh, you've done a very good job of summarizing the debate or the history of the debate, okay, uh, how it has unfolded probably in the last 200, 250 years or so. Now, um, you know, you haven't given an indication of where you stand in the matter, you know, which way you are leaning yourself uh, as to the theory that uh, most, you think most definitively explains the, the, the facts on the ground, which is the similarity of the languages. Would you care to share a little bit about what you think really happened? Oh, you're on mute, you're, you had unmute. Conrad, you had unmute. Yeah, good. Now we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Well, as for the language family, that of course can be decided by linguistic evidence. But you know, it's not just the fact that there is a language family, but the question where it came from. Now here, the linguistic evidence, the archaeological evidence, and very, very certainly now the genetic evidence, only give indirect evidence. You see, what would really help us is if we have a human, in human language, a description of what happened. And it so happens that we have that. Mm. You see, in fact, the, the, the other camp already thought we had that at least as far as the Aryan invasion theory was concerned. They thought that the invasion is described in the Rig Veda in scenes like the Battle of the Ten Kings. But that was only the invasion which happened about 2000 years later than the fragmentation of the original Proto-Indo-European. So nobody thought that we could get at that. The oldest Indo-European writings are in Hittite, in Mycenaean Greek and in Vedic. And they were all deemed to be from about 1500 BC, which is more than 2000 years later than the original um, Proto-Indo-European. However, 
here comes in Sri Kantalagiri. Uh, he's uh, Indian. He is now retired, but he was all his life a bank clerk. And the enemy does never fail to emphasize that. Oh, he's an outsider. He's not an academic. Uh, he's a bank clerk. Well, nevertheless, um, <laughs> he's, of course, from a, a very traditional family. He knows the tradition. He doesn't know Sanskrit too well. Um, he started where very many Westerners start. But of course, over the years, he studied it so thoroughly that now he knows more than most anyone in the field. But what he did was to show that the Vedas, first of all, are much older than taught in university. Uh, they go back to like 3000 BC at least, at least the Rig Veda. And, um, and they describe some of the later parts of the fragmentation of Indo-European. You see, in his uh, scheme, first you have the leaving of the Druhyu tribe from the Northwest. They are defeated and leave India. And it is described of them that they set up cities in Afghanistan and beyond. Like Gandhara is named after one of their chieftains. So they are a part of the Aryan emigration and they must be the ancestors of the Slavs, the Balts, the Celts, the Romans, and indeed the Germanic people. So I'm maybe the only Druhio here in the room. Um, so at least linguistically, you know, we continue what the Druhios have brought us. Then um, <coughs> West Punjab is then taken in by the Anava tribe who originally come from Himachal Kashmir. And they then uh, come into conflict with the Vedic people. And this is where the battle of the 10 Kings takes place. And two generations later, the Varshagira battle. And so that's also won by the Vedic people. So the Iranians also leave India. Afghanistan becomes their new heartland. And the Sanabas also include uh, the last remnants of the Greeks, the Albanians, the Armenians. So that's, that's the last part of the, um, of the fragmentation of Indo-European. You get an even later migration from India um, that doesn't leave any specific linguistic imprint, not now at least. The Mitanni people in Syria, about 1500 BC, the Kassites in Babylonia, also about that age, probably also the Yazidis in present day Northern Iraq. You see, they all come from India, but at a later stage. And so they take complete Sanskrit with them. It's no longer, you know, a pre-Sanskrit, some dialect. No, 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 it's real Sanskrit that they take with them, only they lose their language. They get assimilated with the Hurites and the Babylonians and so on. Um, but so it's very logical because India is a de demographic powerhouse. You know, if something happens in India, be it a famine or a political crisis or so, and a group of people feels the need to leave India, well, in Central Asia, they immediately become a very large part of the population. And conversely, even if in Central Asia, something absolutely terrible happens, and you know, 50% of the people there leave. In India, it's just a speck that you hardly notice. Because you see, India was of such magnitude. And so, you know, it's very logical that India is the, the, the homeland, you know, and not these thinly populated steppes in Russia. So you see, when I saw Talagiri's explanation, I'm, it was, it was a revelation, so to speak. I mean, suddenly all pieces of the puzzle fell into place. Right. And the, the current uh, uh, Western consensus is to simply denigrate Srikanth Talagiri and, and call him names, 
saying that he's just a bank clerk, how can he be taken seriously, yeah. and so on. And that's the way they dismiss him and not take his uh, his arguments uh, mm. seriously. Right. But he keeps working, you see. You can now, you don't even need to buy his books anymore. I mean, sorry to the publisher for saying this, but you know, most of his writings you can follow on his blog. And so he keeps, you know, adding new pieces of the puzzle. It's a very important work. Mm. And like uh, for, instance, for instance, he has shown that the homeland knew of the elephant. Now, <laughs> you know, in the whole expanse of Indo-European, there is only one country that has elephants, right? So you, uh, you know, uh, Conrad, you have very high praise mm -hmm. for the work of Shrikant Talagiri, which yes. I can see. And, uh, you know, you mentioned to me that when this, if this debate ever gets conclusively resolved, uh, one way or the other, Shikant Alagheri's work will prove decisive in the matter. Yes. And it's based on a particular way of interpreting the, the Rig Veda. Right. A way that the, the Western scholars have not done. They have tried to force a different interpretation on the Veda, whereas Shikant's interpretation is much more plausible and, and, and uh, reasonable. Is your, yeah, your, it, your... Just, it just reads what is there. Like, for example, in this Battle of the Ten Kings, Western scholars have said, you see, these are the, the Aryan invaders coming into India. But in fact, the story itself in the Rig Veda says twice that the, the enemies are coming from the West. You see, it is the, the, the Aryans themselves who are supposed to be coming from the West. And here they're coming from the East. You see, I mean, there are so many things that are like obviously wrong in the standard narrative. And so there, Talagheri remains far more faithful to the data. And so he can come up with this, this very comprehensive theory that proves ever more right. Okay, uh, there's, there's lots of questions in the question box. There are about 40 questions, so we don't have enough time to go through all the questions. So I'm going to pick like a few questions. Uh, let's see. So uh, let me ask this one, uh, uh, Conrad. What, what do you see? What do you see as the future of this debate? What do you see unfolding in the in the upcoming years? You know, is this going to uh, settle down in any way? Yes, of course. You see, many people are pessimistic about all kinds of subjects, and so, especially in history, there are always people who say we will never know. And and so about the homeland too. There are many people in Europe who say, well, you know. This Russia is nice, but we don't really know and we will never know. No, I think we will definitely know. And so this debate will be over maybe in 20 years or so. And of course, then, then there are many details that remain to be filled in. There always are. But um, the, the, the basic idea that the homeland is India, I think that will be well established. And so we are now we now have to overcome this stonewalling from the other camp, but I'm sure that that is temporary. The power equation that nowadays explains this massive anti-Hindu prejudice, that's not going to remain forever. Why do you believe it will not remain forever? Well, <laughs> Look, for instance, in politics. You see, America was always on the side of Pakistan against India. Then comes Trump, and he suddenly starts to say, yeah, but you know, Pakistan is a terrorist country, and India is our ally, and we also need India against China, and so on. And so he starts suddenly becoming friends with India. Then comes Biden, and in some respects, he completely reverses everything that Trump has done but not concerning India. 
He's not maybe as enthusiastically pro-India as Trump was, but in most respects, he is continuing that policy. And so, because the world has changed, Pakistan is no longer important and, and, and bets on the China card more than on the America card at the moment. And China needs to be contained. So he too is going to continue to more or less woo India. And yeah, so, so, so you see these power equations can change quite quickly. So I'm not too, too worried about that. But, you know, uh, I mean, just to be uh, appropriate here, how the power equations may change and India may certainly have a more important role on the world stage. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that's going to alter the theory on the ground, which is a more of an academic matter. Yes, I agree. It's not that simple. It will mm -hmm. certainly have an effect. But yes, of course, we have to continue the struggle. It's not mm -hmm. that automatically something in the world is going to change and we have to do nothing. No, no, of course we have to continue this debate. And so what is important now, I think, is to somehow get people on the other side to react and to really face the arguments. Now, I think that is more and more happening. Like the, the occasion for me to speak about this mm -hmm. is that I managed to get an explanation of the whole debate published in a uh, festive the tribute book for my former professor of Indo-European linguistics. And so, you know, all the people contributing there are just standard, you know, Indo-Europeanists. So this way, at least I get to address them. Mm. You know, I speak on a forum that is also theirs. So, and then, you know, you have all this modern technology. People may prefer not to be seen as reading Talageri, but, you know, secretly in their own room, they put on their computer and they go to Talageri's blog and they read him anyway. Mm. So, you know, I, I think circumstances are relatively propitious in the middle long term. So, from, from the Hindu standpoint, uh, what, what do you think the Hindus can do, at, at least the ones that are inclined towards a more scholarly uh, conversation? Uh, yeah. what, can, what can they do uh, rather than just tweet about it or uh, be upset about something on Facebook and so on? Well, you see, there are, there are a number of things being done. You see... In, in the humanities, Hindus have always been very absent. I won't say weak, but just absent. They're just not there. Mm -hmm. Because every, every Indian has to study engineering. Even if he wants to do philosophy, his father tells him, no, 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 do something useful. And so Indians have not been very active there. However, now that, well, first of all, archaeology, but now especially genetics, their Indians have really come into their own. Mm. And so I don't think genetics has the decisive evidence, but it is somewhat important. And so there, you know, everything coming from the West is, is immediately responded to by Indians and often very competently. Like in December 2019, there was a conference about this new evidence in, in Hyderabad. I was surprised to see the competence and the, the self-confidence of many Indians. They, mm -hmm. they are not impressed anymore by you know, the R in invasion hypothesis. They feel they can counter it. Okay, terrific. I think, uh, Ankur, can you show the, uh, the survey results? Okay, so we got 17 yeses and 23 maybes. All right, wonderful. 50 said no. All right, very good. So with that, I think uh, we've been at it for almost 90 minutes. We will close this uh, webinar today. And uh, thank you all for attending, participating, and asking many questions that we did not get to answer. But, uh, uh, you know, that's the way it is sometimes. Uh, uh, Dr. Els, thank you so much for joining. And My pleasure. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Namaste, everybody. 
Bye-bye.